I'm Dr. Tanya Harrison from Planet Labs and the Outer Space Institute, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about extraterrestrial remote sensing. So if you think about it, anything that we do in space with NASA missions, European Space Agency missions, things like that, it's all remote sensing. We don't have any humans on the ground anywhere to do any of this work. And so when we're planning what we want to do with these missions, what kind of science we want to do, the instrumentation that we need to build to be able to do that science, we have to take all of that into account. And so to give you an idea of the kind of things that influence those design decisions and what we can do beyond planet Earth in the remote sensing sphere, I figured we would go on a tour of some of the instrumentation that we sent to Mars. One, for selfish reasons, that's my main background is working on Martian geology and Mars missions. And two, Mars is the most well-studied planet in our solar system beyond the Earth in terms of the number of missions that we've sent and the amount of data that we have to understand it. So what remote sensing instruments have we sent to Mars and how did we decide on the ones that we were going to send? And there's a long history here that starts all the way back with telescopic observations from the 1800s. But we'll get into those in a couple slides. So I'm gonna go through these in terms of the different pieces of science that we wanted to do at Mars and then some of the instrumentation that we used to go through each of those things. One of the big things that we want to understand with Mars is change monitoring, because we've known ever since looking at it through telescopes, again, from the 1800s onward, that Mars has experienced a lot of changes. We didn't always know what those were from, from telescopic observations, but when we got there, we saw this really vibrant world with dust storms and changing polar caps, and so we really wanted to understand this dynamic system. And this long-term monitoring really started with the Mars Orbiter camera aboard Mars Global Surveyor, which orbited Mars from 1997 until we lost contact with the mission in late 2006. And the Mars Orbiter camera had a set of imaging systems, a wide angle and a narrow angle. In this case, we're talking specifically about the wide angle cameras. And the goal of these was mostly twofold. One was to look at changes in the albedo patterns on the surface, so the light and dark patterns that we can see and weather monitoring for mission support. And this is an animation of some of these global views that we got with the Mars Orbiter camera. So this was essentially a framing camera that got these full color global snapshots almost every single day of the Mars Global Surveyor mission. And I think a lot of scientists don't even know that work on Mars don't even know that this data set exists. We have this really rich, vibrant daily global data that can show you about these albedo patterns and the weather monitoring. But why did we want to look at changes in albedo patterns in the first place? This is where we go back to the 1800s. Astronomers like Giovanni Schiaparelli could look at Mars through their primitive telescopes and make out the patterns of light and dark on the surface. And when you look at the planets through your telescope, it's inverted. So this map that he's drawn here actually has the south pole at the top part of the image and the north pole at the bottom. And he drew this map that doesn't necessarily conform all that well to what Mars actually looks like, but there are a few things that do hold. Um, Mare Astral, the Southern Highlands, um, the Hellas Impact Basin, uh, the Argyre Impact Basin. There's a few things here that do actually exist on Mars. And we've held a lot of these names over as we've given Mars official names for things on its surface. But this is where the idea of monitoring these changes came from because looking at these maps, they were changing over time. Then the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter came along. It got into orbit in March of 2006, and uh, Mars Global Surveyor unfortunately died in November of 2006. There was a plan to have these coordinated observations for a long time, um, and they only, only ended up overlapping for a few months. Um, but the Mars Color Imager, or MARSI, on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was designed to carry on this legacy of doing this daily global color imaging of the planet. Um, again, to look at changes in the albedo patterns globally and to look at weather monitoring. And these images, this is an example of a global mosaic released from Marcy. The company that built and operates Marcy, Malin Space Science Systems based in San Diego, puts out a weekly weather report for Mars where you can actually get the information from the scientists running the instrument in terms of what was happening on Mars in that past week. So the image that you can see here, there are some gaps. Um, that's due to the spacecraft slewing to do other observations. There's a lot of different instruments on this particular spacecraft. Um, 
we're not trying to hide aliens or anything like that, but it gets you in general these daily global mosaics, again, for almost every single day of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. And this is what drew me to Planet, actually. I had spent a lot of years working as an operations person on the Marcy team. And the way that Marcy operates is really similar to the way that Planet operates their constellation of Dove satellites here at Earth. And in this case, we have multiple satellites compared to just a single satellite and a single camera at Mars. But you have these satellites that are acting as a line scanner, taking a continuous strip of images from pole to pole as you're going along in the orbits. That's the same thing that Marcy does. So if we look at how planet builds up coverage of the Earth every single day, you get these long strips of images that are built up of little framelets, essentially, we call them scenes. And you get this picture of the entire landmass of the Earth every single day. So you can watch for these large scale changes over time. Now, planet does this at a much higher resolution than Marcy does. The planet is three meters and Marcy is one to 10 kilometers, depending on uh, how you set the binning for your camera but it still gets us a lot of great information. So the way that Marcy works is that it takes this continuous strip from pole to pole for every orbit. And so it takes a number of strips to mosaic the whole planet every day. It can only operate up to about eight degrees off nadir. And so any place where the spacecraft has slewed more than that, we get these black gaps in the data, unfortunately, but generally you still get a, a complete picture. It's made up of a fisheye lens, and so the edges of each strip are a little bit blurrier than the center, so you'll tend to see um, a little bit of blurriness along the seams. And you also get some color fringing around the edges just due to the way that the filters on the fisheye line up. So we have nine different filters on this camera, and the green and pink fringing obviously are not real effects on Mars. These are just effects of the camera. But the cool thing you can do is watch for very long time periods, how the weather is changing. So this is an example of weather for one entire Mars year, which is about two Earth years. Down at the bottom here, we've got the date on Earth. So we're in early 2007 here. And the marker next to it, um, L sub S, is solar longitude, which is how we measure the date on Mars. Um, so everything is broken up in 360 degrees to tell us where Mars is in its orbit around the sun. And from that, we know what season we're in in the Northern and Southern hemisphere. This was a year that was particularly interesting in terms of weather because it was one of the years of a global dust storm. Mars routinely gets these storms. Here it is starting. So you'll notice uh, a lot of the surface has been obscured from view. And if you watch over time, this took months for the dust to settle out of the air before we could really see the surface again. These storms happen at the same time every year, but don't necessarily happen every year. So we know when to keep an eye out for them and some of the warning signs to look for, but we don't always know if it's going to happen that year or not. So a lot of stuff that you're seeing here, anything that is sort of a pink, wispy, puffy feature are dust clouds. And then the more uh, wispy blue features are actually water ice clouds. So these are really similar to cirrus clouds here on Earth. They're really high altitude clouds made up of tiny, tiny crystals of water ice. You'll notice too, the edges of the image are changing at the South Pole and the North Pole. And that's as the planet is moving seasonally, you're going from having the pole, the South Pole on the day side of the planet to having it on the night side of the planet. Um, now this is winter in the Southern Hemisphere. And so the South Pole is completely in shadow and the North Pole is completely visible. And I really like to show this video because it helps emphasize just how dynamic Mars is. And we don't really get that view in a lot of the still images that get, re get released from either the satellites or the rovers. Um, there's a lot going on all the time. And so this is why we have to plan around all of this. We want to make sure that we land our future missions in places that aren't going to be affected by dust storms year after year after year. If there is a dust storm going toward a landed mission, we want to make sure it's safe. And this is something that's happened before. Uh, back in 2008, so the year after the very large dust storm, we had some smaller regional storms headed toward the Spirit Rover. And what we would do is watch the boundaries of these storms and over the course of a few days, monitor the trajectory of the storm. So is it moving closer to the rover? If it got within about a thousand kilometers, that was a little bit of a danger sign. This one got within 400 kilometers and that was huge danger sign. So we immediately contacted the team operating the Spirit Rover, told them essentially to batten down the hatches, 
These rovers drive at meters per day at the most, so we can't drive them out of the way of these storms. Instead, we just have to shut down critical systems, make sure the rovers aren't using too much power, and do everything that we can to sort of conserve all the energy that it does have and hope that it can weather out the storm. This is an example of what Spirit's solar panels looked like before the storm. So this is an image taken from the rover kind of looking down at its own deck. You can see the solar panels pretty clean. They're sort of a grayish blue color. But after that storm, this is what they looked like. So this is obviously not great from a power standpoint. Uh, if you have a lot of dust in the way of the sun and your solar panels, you're not getting much energy to your battery. So this actually caused the power levels in the rover to drop to record lows. Conveniently, when these storms come through, sometimes they also have a tendency to blow the dust off the solar panels for us. So we routinely had what we call these cleaning events to come by and clean the dust off the rovers. And this happened year after year after year for Spirit, and it never has come to any problems like this. Uh, Opportunity, on the other hand, which landed the same month as Spirit, um, but in a different place on Mars, ended up being lost actually due to um, a large dust storm depositing a lot of dust on the solar panels, we think at least, um, and making the batteries discharge to a point where we could no longer regain contact with the rover. Uh, in 2018, we had another one of these global dust storms. And this is a view, again, from that Marcy camera, the Mars color imager, of what Mars looked like on May 28th versus July 1st. You can see that it almost looks like an entirely different planet. These storms can cause a ton of problems. You're not only causing uh, potential problems to the rovers on the surface, you're also causing issues to the satellites in orbit because they can't necessarily see through the dust to keep imaging the surface, to see where the rovers are or to keep doing science. But if you have some of these more regional storms, you can plan around those for where you want to take images. The amount of data we can send back from Mars on any given day is so incredibly limited. Our bandwidth is ridiculous. Like you would never complain about your home internet again if you had to deal with the amount of data that we can trickle back from Mars on a single day. So we have to be really, really strategic about how we plan where we're going to image because there might be some days, especially when Mars is at its farthest point from the Earth, that with um, another camera I worked on, the context camera, for example, when Mars was really far away, we might get four images a day back. When Mars was at its closest point in the orbit to Earth, we might get 200 images a day. So it's a really huge difference in the bandwidth. Um, but we want to make sure that we're not trying to shoot through storms if we can avoid them. So that's where things like these weather monitoring cameras come in handy. This particular global dust storm was so significant that you could see it through relatively small telescopes. This is an 18 centimeter diameter telescope in Rome. And you can see the difference between Mars in 2016 during its closest approach versus during the dust storm in 2018. We don't just see changes at the large scale in terms of these giant storms and the albedo patterns. We also see really small scale changes happening as well. Uh, these images are from the High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment, or HiRISE, also aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, so same spacecraft as Marcy. And this, this camera takes images at 25 centimeters per pixel, which is the highest resolution data we have for any planet beyond Earth. And we don't even have that much data available on Earth at that resolution, unless you're getting it from like commercial imagery providers. So it's really amazing that we have this really vast data set from Mars. Some of the stuff we've been able to see with high rise include these avalanches occurring on the edges of the northern polar cap. So all of the white and red stuff that you see here, these are layers of ice and dust in the northern polar cap of Mars. This is made up of, of water ice. Um, and all these puffy cloud features are actually dust avalanches that we caught as they were happening. So these are avalanches in motion. And the first few we happen to catch sort of by accident. We weren't specifically looking for these necessarily, but once we saw them, we were able to keep monitoring these slopes year after year after year and determine that the avalanches happen in the same place at the same time of year every single year. And so this is a really beautiful example of science, making serendipitous discoveries and then being able to hone in on the patterns that come in out of those. We've also found a lot of new gully flows. And this is an example from Mars Global Surveyor, but uh, we've seen many subsequent ones with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter as well. And if you're familiar with terrestrial geology, gullies are channels that you tend to find on hill slopes, so the sides of mountains and things like that. And they're usually formed by debris flows. So 
mud flows, debris flows, material flowing down a hill, carving a channel, and you end up with an alcove where the stuff that fell down the hill came from, a channel where that stuff came down the hill, and an apron at the bottom of the hill where that stuff was eventually deposited. We found thousands of these all over the surface of Mars across the mid-latitudes in both hemispheres, only in the mid-latitudes, which is really interesting, tells us that there's a climate control on their formation. And then uh, during the Mars Global Surveyor mission, they decided to start monitoring these to see if they saw any changes in the gullies. And they found two examples where they had an image with the gully looking like one example, uh, and an image, sort of what we call the after image, where something had changed. So this is an example from a crater called Naruko in the southern highlands of Mars. And uh, the leftmost image is the gully in this particular crater as it appeared in 2001. And then Mars Global Surveyor shot it again in 2005. And sometime between those two images, this light tone flow appeared uh, in the gully channel. The flow features, it's the resolution is not fantastic in this particular image. I think it's about three meters per pixel. Um, Remember, this is taken a while ago. Uh, you can see some features like the digitate termination, so fingering at the end of the flow. And from this, uh, Malin and his co-authors in 2006 proposed that this flow was actually lubricated by liquid water. We've been monitoring these over time to see if more new gully flows had formed, and there have been dozens discovered at this point, anything from big flows like this to places where we've seen just a few boulders move inside a channel. But this might have some really important implications for both the history of liquid water on Mars and maybe some stuff happening with water on Mars in the present day. Back to the high-rise camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we've also used the high-resolution camera combined with the color aspect of that camera to monitor these things called recurring slope lineae, which were just discovered in the last decade. And these are features, there are these dark streaks in the images here that grow incrementally over time on slopes during the warmest part of the year and then slowly fade away. From this, we thought that it was probably some kind of liquid water assisted flow, maybe a really, really briny flow so that the water would be stable under current surface conditions on Mars because the temperature is really low and the air pressure is really low. So it's not really at the point where liquid water can be stable, except in a few conditions on the surface, like a few specific places. And even then it's only for a few hours at the most. So there were a few places where they imaged the stuff left behind by these recurring slope lineae with another instrument aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter called the Compact Imaging, say Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars. These are all such mouthfuls of names. Uh, we call it CRISM for short. And it's a multispectral imager that we'll talk about later in the presentation. But it detected some signs of uh, evaporite salts left behind by these flows, which supported the idea that they were formed by some kind of flowing liquid water. But in general, they are so small that they're beyond the resolution limit of CRISM. And so we can't really get a good image of them globally. Um, it's hard to explain what they would be otherwise, just because we don't have really good You'd have this incremental growth and then fading. So speaking of CRISM, uh, we've also sent a lot of different spectrometers to Mars looking at different wavelength ranges. And those wavelength ranges have changed based on the different things that we learned about Mars over time. So with Mars Global Surveyor, uh, just for some historical context, Mars Global Surveyor was the first mission that we sent back to Mars post-Viking, which was in the mid 70s. So there was a gap between basically 1976 and 1996, where we didn't have any successful missions to Mars. So Mars Global Surveyor brought new technology and a ton of new instruments that we didn't have before to give us more scientific data. And one of the instruments on board was a thermal emission spectrometer. There had been some debate early on about what wavelength range we should be looking at Mars in to learn the most about the surface. And the initial decision was we should look in the thermal. Well, the map here on the left shows you a global view of what Mars looks like in the thermal. And if you aren't a geologist, basically, these are all flavors of volcanic rock, volcanic rock, more volcanic rock, some dusty volcanic rock, some ice and clouds, except for that one bright red bit near the center of the map, which is martematite rich. And if we zoom in on that, that's the view on the right hand side with uh, taking a high resolution look at it. This is a place where we saw high concentrations of hematite compared to anywhere else on the planet. And because of that, this is where 
um, scientists decided to land the Opportunity rover to go and investigate the source of this hematite signature. And this is what Opportunity found. This area was littered with these things that we call blueberries in the Mars community. Uh, the Earth example in the lower left, um, these are called the Moki marbles, and they find them in Utah. So we think that this is the terrestrial analog for the things that we're seeing on Mars. These are hematite concretions that formed in these groundwater environments where water was flowing through the fractures in these rocks and essentially leached out the iron that was within them. Within them and then they uh, constituted into these tiny spherules that are now on the outsides of the rocks thanks to erosion. So from this, we learned that this entire area was a place that was sort of cycling between playa environments. So it would be wet and then everything would evaporate and dry out and then it would get wet again and everything would evaporate and dry out. And this was all discovered based on this one signature that we found in the thermal data. But you can see there wasn't much else interesting going on in the thermal data from this particular type of context. I don't want any folks that do thermal work on Mars to get angry for me saying that. There's other interesting stuff about the thermal, but not really in terms of looking for these hydrated minerals or these minerals that can tell us about um, other specific things that we were looking at for these rover missions. In a future missions, we shifted the wavelength a bit to start looking in the visible near infrared and the short wave infrared. And Mars lit up like a Christmas tree in this wavelength range. Uh, this is a map of hydrated minerals from 2014. So it's a few years out of date now. There's probably even more detections at this point. But we were finding hydrated phyllosilicates, hydrated opaline silicas, chlorides, hydrated sulfates, hydrated carbonate minerals all over the planet, basically anywhere that you had exposures, mostly of these light tone layered rocks. Um, they look very distinctive compared to a lot of the other rocks on Mars. We saw a signature of some of these hydrated minerals. And obviously this is really important for investigating the history of water on Mars. There were two different instruments that we sent. One was this CRISM instrument that I talked about before, and the other one was called Omega, which uh, is a French name, and my French is awful, so I will not even try to pronounce it, um, but it's an instrument aboard the Mars Express spacecraft run by the European Space Agency. And CRISM really helped us look for some prime examples of places that we might want to land future missions. And one of the things that we found with CRISM was this mound of layered hydrated material in a crater called Gale. The spectral data is a little bit messy in the colorized version here, but you can see that uh, this is a view, the perspective view is in the lower right, of a mountain that is sitting inside of a crater, and we'll see a context view on the next slide. And the mound is made up of a lot of different layers of hydrated clays on the bottom that transition to hydrated sulfates as you move toward the top. And then the very top of the mountain has no evidence of water alteration at all. So there's some interesting geologic history of Mars recorded in this mound inside this crater. And we could see the layered material just in the visible um, imagery that we had, the panchromatic imagery, but we didn't have an idea of this compositional structure until we sent one of these spectrometers. So this on the left is a context view of what Gale Crater looks like. And because of this interesting composition in the mound, we decided to send the Curiosity rover to this particular site. Um, you can see where Curiosity landed in the upper left there. It's not to scale. Look at the scale bar on the bottom. Um, Curiosity is about the size of a minivan. But we were able to combine a lot of different remote sensing data sets to help us try and understand exactly what's going on in Gale Crater. So we have the visible imagery, which is uh, mostly panchromatic from the context camera, and then some high resolution snapshots around certain places from the high rise camera at that 25 centimeters per pixel. From those, we can make a morphologic map in terms of the stuff we see in the upper right here. And then combining that with the spectral information that we have from CRISM, we can put together some compositional information as well and combine all of those things to try to synthesize the history of Gale Crater. And the thing that we've been able to determine from this is that Gale Crater used to be an ancient lake. And over time, that lake evaporated, left these layers of clays and sulfates behind. Eventually, this entire crater, which is about 150 kilometers in diameter, was filled and buried and then exhumed. And we can tell this because the mound in the crater is actually taller than the crater itself. We see this in a few different places on Mars, lots of areas where places were completely buried and then exhumed. Um, and so that tells us that there's been a really complex history here. You can also see in the visible data on the left, uh, if, if you're 
adept at looking at satellite images, you might recognize that there's a bunch of channels here as well. There's some channels carving the walls of the crater. There's also channels incising the mound in the crater itself. That mound is what Curiosity is driving up right now. But the top part of the mound has none of these fluvial features. And that's why we're really interested in like looking at how this has changed over time. What's recorded in that wet part of Mars versus the dry Mars. Another area that was really spectrally interesting that we found with CRISM after we had looked at Gale Crater was a delta in a crater called Jezero. And this delta is made up of hydrated clays and carbonates. And if we zoom out to get a context view of this, uh, it looks a little different because it's the visible data, but um, this is the Jezero delta. And you can see the channel actually moving through the crater rim and off toward the west side of the image here. And this is where we're going to be sending the 2020 rover called Perseverance, which launches in July of next year. And the idea is to try and we can't land super close to the delta, just terrain wise. So we've landed farther away and we're driving into the delta to try and get a look at the material that's in there because these layered clay materials on Earth in delta type sediments tend to be really good at preserving biosignatures. And that's really what we're looking for with this particular rover. So if we zoom out even more, this is a Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter, or MOLA, view of the area. So you can see the, the crater really nicely and the rim in the red. And you can see the, the channel incising from the west and then the Jezero Delta kind of at the mouth there. But you also notice on the east side of the crater, there's another channel going out the other side. So this crater was a lake that we think at least was fed from the west the lake filled up inside this crater to the point where it overflowed out the east side of the crater and carved this secondary channel. So again, we have a really vibrant lake environment that we're hoping to explore with this rover. And right now, all the information that we're going off of to make our inferences are completely based on satellite data. We don't have any data on the ground for this point yet. But we can try to put together as much geology and the ideas of what we think the history are here from the data that we have. So we've put together timing of local geology. We've tried to put together the timing of what might have happened inside that lake, build up entire geologic histories based off the data that we have. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of extrapolation going on. I'm sure any terrestrial geologist would tell you it's hard to say some of these things definitively without getting data on the ground. But when this is all you have to work with, we work really, really hard to try and understand the relationships of these units relative to each other and what we can see in the imagery and understanding how those units might have interacted with each other by looking at the spectral data. The last big category we're going to take a look at is looking underground on Mars. And this is where some really interesting stuff has been hiding from us looking that we've taken a look at with a few different types of instruments. The first one is the gamma ray spectrometer on the Mars Odyssey mission, which got to Mars in 2001 and is actually still operating today. It's the longest lived mission at Mars. And this particular instrument, uh, I won't go into too much detail about how gamma ray spectrometers work, but the short version is basically, um, we're looking at gamma rays and neutrons that are emitted from the surface to look at them as a proxy for hydrogen. And while we're measuring the neutrons, the neutrons are a proxy for hydrogen, and hydrogen is a proxy for water. Because in rocks, hydrogen doesn't just tend to hang out as hydrogen. It's usually bound up in water, H2O, or hydroxyl, OH. And if you're a geologist, at least if you're a Mars geologist, OH and H2O are both called water when we're looking at this sort of thing. And so uh, the folks working on this mission were able to make this global water map using this hydrogen proxy to see that there appear to be a lot of water just within the upper few meters of the surface on Mars based on these gamma ray spectrometer measurements. And so this influenced the decision to start sending ground penetrating radars to Mars to take a look at the actual distribution and structure of that ice. One of those is the Sherrod instrument, which is shallow radar on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this is a really fantastic instrument for looking at fine scale layering relatively close to the surface. Um, one of the most beautiful examples that we have from Sherrod is this lovely cross section of the northern polar cap of Mars in radar. So on the left, you have a color view from the Mars Orbiter camera of what the northern polar cap of Mars looks like. I mentioned before, it's made up of layers of ice and dust. Um, the grayscale view that's on the top right 
is a shader relief map from that Mars Orbiter laser altimeter. And then the bottom view, the really dark view, is the actual Sherrod radar grams. And you can actually see the layers inside the polar cap. So we can make out the water ice layers, which are the dark areas. And then you can see the dust layers, which are the bright areas that are kind of deep marking the, low, the differences between the different water layers. And so we're seeing a climate history of Mars recorded over time in this track, which is really, really incredible. So it's definitely going to be an area where we'd want to go and start taking some ice cores when humans get there to figure out what actually happened in the geologic history of Mars. One of the bigger discoveries with this instrument outside the polar regions, uh, one of the goals to look to use it was to look for buried liquid water aquifers, which had been hypothesized by some folks to be actually the source of water for those gully features we talked about earlier. We didn't really see any evidence of liquid water aquifers, but Sherrod did find a gigantic buried ice deposit with nearly pure water ice, um, up to 85% ice by volume, just a few meters below the surface and up to 100 meters thick. I think the greatest thickness is about 120 in some places. In this area called Utopia Planitia, marked with the orange star on the map. And if we take a look at it with the context camera six meter panchromatic data that we have from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter um, overlaid on a digital elevation model, this is what that area looks like. So it's really hummocky. There's a lot of scallop depressions that we see in some paraglacial environments here on Earth. So Earth's that areas on Earth that have been affected by ice in some way that are proximal to glaciers. And the volume of this entire ice deposit is larger than that of Lake Superior. So this is the largest non-polar deposit of ice on Mars discovered entirely thanks to this radar instrument. There were some features at the surface here that hinted that there might have been ice, but there was no way for us to determine it with, you know, fairly cert with fair certainty until you get the radar instrument. Obviously, you're dealing with radar not directly water, but you're measuring a dielectric constant, which is um, a property of the material that you're looking at. And from that, you can try to back and figure out what the material is. And the material is likely to be water based on that dielectric constant and the conditions of Mars. Um, so just a quick recap of this slide in case it dropped out uh, in terms of what I was saying about this one. Um, we imaged these craters with the visible and near-infrared spectrometer on the CRISM instrument, and we were able to determine that this light tone material that had been exposed by these impact craters was actually made up of water ice. And then we visually monitored these craters over the course of many months after that, and we watched this light tone material fade away. So we interpreted that to mean that the water ice was sublimating back into the atmosphere, so it was turning from solid into gas. And uh, this is because at the latitudes we were seeing these impacts between about 40 to 50-ish degrees latitude, water ice is not stable on the surface for long periods of time. So once it had been unburied by these craters, it then just relatively quickly in the geologic sense uh, sublimated away. And this is just a pretty picture of one of the more striking examples of one of those ice excavating craters. So the crater itself is a little bit hard to make out, but the light tone material is all that ice that was excavated from the subsurface and then deposited onto the surface where we could see it with both the imaging cameras and the uh, imaging spectrometer. So this is the most up-to-date map that I could find in terms of where these craters have been found. Most of them are in the Northern Hemisphere, north of about 40 degrees latitude. There's a couple in the Southern Hemisphere. This is just because it's really hard to find new craters on Mars unless they're in the really dusty areas. So the high albedo areas that we can see in things like the Mars Orbiter camera and the Mars Color Imager data that I showed before, because they form those blast zones. If you have a crater that forms in an area without that dust, we don't get the blast zone, and they're so small, they're really hard to see. So we really rely on a human seeing that blast zone to be able to then call on the higher resolution camera to say, hey, there's something here, can you take a look at it to verify whether this is an impact crater, or maybe it's just an area where, say, dust has been removed by wind, which is the case every once in a while, but it's usually a crater. They look pretty distinctive. And because of these discoveries between Sherrod and these ice excavating impacts, more radar is really high priority for NASA's next Mars orbiter. It's actually in like the NASA highest recommended plans for Mars. We need higher resolution radar 
we need to get more radar information in the really shallow subsurface. So there's what we call the missing meters from Sherrod. We don't really know what that upper 10 meters of the subsurface looks like very well. We have a little bit of information from these ice excavating impacts. And we have the Phoenix lander, which about 13 years ago landed on Mars and dug some trenches where it exposed ice. So we know what's going on in the top couple centimeters and then what's going on at like 10 plus meters depth. But that shallow part is really important because if we're going to be sending humans to Mars in the relatively near future, we want to know where the easily accessible water deposits are for drinking water, for manufacturing rocket fuel to get back from Mars. There's all sorts of things that we would want to obviously know what, where the water is, how pure it is, and can the astronauts actually get to it. So the takeaway from all of this is that scientific discoveries influence the design of these missions, and it's just a constantly evolving process. So we had telescopic observations teaching us about how the albedo patterns on Mars were changing over time. This led to the suggestion that maybe there were storms going on. Also some fanciful ideas that there might be vegetation on Mars, which obviously we got there and there aren't any. And then we moved on to satellite observations where we could actually see things that were going on on the ground, start putting together the entire geologic history between visible data in panchromatic and color bands, and then getting imaging spectrometer data and thermal spectrometer data, laser altimetry, um, gamma ray spectrometer, combining all of this information together to help pick the places that we wanted to study more in depth on the ground, getting as close to not remote sensing as you could on another planet, I guess. We're still doing it remotely as humans, but we've got a rover on the ground doing science in the places that we were able to narrow down from combining all of these satellite uh, data sources to figure out what are the places on the surface that can teach us the most about Mars, or at least what are the most interesting places to help us put together the larger picture of what the ge geologic history of Mars might have been. And this comes into play for designing instruments for missions to anywhere else in the solar system as well. You know, for Venus, for example, we learned a lot from the Magellan radar that we sent in the early 1990s. You can't see the surface of Mars without a, sorry, the surface of Venus without a radar because the clouds are so thick. So now we know we want to go back with better, better radar instruments. Um, flying out to Europa with the Galileo mission, we got information that suggested that Europa might have had a subsurface ocean or has a subsurface ocean. And so from that information from Galileo from the 90s, we are building upon that designing now this Europa Clipper mission that's going to fly to Europa in the late 2020s to learn more about that subsurface ocean and what the properties of that might be. So we put together all these instruments to try to put together this big picture of how these planets have been evolving over time. And as we learn new things, it helps us figure out what instruments we actually want to send. And with that, if you guys have any questions about remote sensing in general for planetary stuff, Mars specifically, any of the scientific discoveries that I mentioned in this presentation, I'm happy to try and answer as many of those as I can for you. Yes. Hey, Tanya, how's it going there? Um, Good. Thanks for doing this. And we do have a couple questions on the line. Let me start by asking, uh, Mars is the most studied, but Venus is considered our sister planet. Why more on Mars? And that's coming from Tom. That's a great question. There's a whole community of Venusian scientists that would love to give answers to that question. Um, basically, Mars has held our attention for a long time because of the search for life and its watery past. It's something that we've really, really wanted to understand whether or not Mars had life. Venus doesn't really have much prospect for life in the present. And it's really, really difficult to land missions there. You know, the Russians sent the Venera missions and they essentially melted within an hour and a half of landing uh, or they were crushed by the atmospheric pressure. It's not an easy place to study. Um, it's also actually harder to get to Venus than it is to get to Mars just in terms of orbital dynamics. Um, it takes longer to get to Venus because you have to kind of slow down as you're moving toward the inner part of the solar system. Um, but Venus has been neglected for a long time. And because it is sort of our twin planet, it's one that we really should uh, be studying more to understand what happened to Venus and how do we make sure that that doesn't happen to Earth. Great. Awesome. Uh, uh, second question, how is looking at Mars comparable with looking at Earth? How is it comparable with looking at other planets? That's a really good question, too. 
So Mars is really, really Earth-like in a lot of ways. And so it really helps to understand Earth geology, or rather you have to stu- have to understand Earth geology to be able to apply that to Mars. I mean, Mars has impact craters, channels, ancient lakes, um, mountains, a lot of the things that you would find on Earth, volcanoes, tons of volcanoes all over the place. But you have to study those on Earth and get some context and then apply those to Mars. There are some things on Mars, though, that we don't see on Earth. Um, there's areas called chaos terrain that are just weird, gigantic areas of collapse that we don't fully understand because we don't have them on Earth. There are a lot of ideas out there. Um, and then when you take that and apply it to other planets, the same thing holds for all of the terrestrial planets, so all the rocky planets in the solar system. There's a lot of things that they have in common that you can apply from one to the, to the other, like impact craters look vaguely similar across all of them. They're really easy to identify. A lot of volcanic features are very, very distinctive on all of the planets that have volcanoes, all of the moons that have volcanoes, like Io as well. I guess I was the only one with an active, with active volcanoes. Um, so it, it's you have to understand all of these things together. And there's specifics about each planet that help you understand what went on there. But having that geologic base on Earth is really what you need to like watch forward from. Nope. Unintended, I guess. Okay. Uh, looks like another question here. Do you think international effect for humans to go to Mars is likely, or is it more likely that is will be more private industry? I think that field is changing so quickly. It's really hard to say. I, I think if you had asked a few years ago if it was possible for private industry to get to Mars before say NASA or the European Space Agency, everybody would have said no. But with how quickly Elon Musk has managed to do things in terms of SpaceX, I mean, I'm wearing a SpaceX t-shirt right now, um, completely coincidental. <laughs> uh, I, I w- actually wouldn't be surprised if he did manage to send humans before a government agency did. Um, so I'm really excited to see what happens either way. Uh, it will definitely inspire people in different ways, depending on you know who gets there first. Okay. Uh, and uh, everybody on the line, either on Twitch, Discord, or our uh, website, feel free to, uh, for another a couple minutes, we're open for questions. Uh, oh, here's one. Uh, do we believe our current estimates of water ice volume and accessibility on Mars would allow future colonies to be water self-sufficient? There is a lot of water there. The last estimate that I had heard was if you melted all of the water that we knew of that was close to the surface, it would get you a global ocean that was 600 meters deep. But that was, if I recall correctly, that was before we had made these discoveries of these large subsurface ice deposits with Sherrod. So there's even more water there than we had anticipated. I think the self-sufficient part really depends on how many people you're talking about. If you're talking about a McMurdo type base, then yes, definitely. Um, If you're talking having huge networks of cities where you have millions of people, then you really have to start looking at things like how efficient is your water recycling system, just how much water is there, how much of it is accessible, how pure is it, stuff like that. And so we're going to have a lot of work to do on the ground once we get there to understand that before we can truly understand how much is actually available for us to use as humans. And then from that, how much we can actually how much of it would we be able to sustain ourselves with? Is it a long-term sustainable thing or not? That's an actually excellent question for several reasons. One, I mean, even just as early as 20 years ago, you know, in schools, they were just, uh, it, it was always a question of if there is water, you know, not now there's just so much of it, you know, and, and, you know, we're talking about, can we sustain ourselves for the long term? But it's just incredible how much water is there. So I think that's an excellent question. Uh, but it's just shocking to, to realize that Mars is more sustain- sustainable than it, than we ever thought possible even now. So uh, I think that's a common thing that we're learning about in space in general is everywhere we look, there's water. And we were really concerned that water would be the scarce thing as we tried to move beyond Earth. But we're finding water on comets, we're finding ice on asteroids, there's water at the south pole of the moon, there's water on Mercury, like water ice, all of these are ices that I'm talking about. Um, It's like everywhere we look, there's water in some form that's managed to hide somewhere on that body. So maybe water's actually not going to be our problem. So we start thinking about, well, what are the other issues? We need oxygen, we need to be able to breathe, we might need some nitrogen, stuff like that. 
Oh, you're on mute. Oh, see, I keep on doing that. That's why I keep on looking down, by the way. I keep on looking at my muted mic. Anyway, I have one more question while we're waiting for more possibly come in. Uh, how about uh, a – you just wrote a book recently, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I was looking to see if – I had a copy sitting on my desk. It's on my bookshelf now. Um, I just wrote a book called For All Humankind, um, which is a series of interviews done with people – who watched or listened to the Apollo movement, but did so from outside of the United States. So uh, the interviewees range from a five-year-old girl at the time of the landing in rural India to a 44-year-old Holocaust survivor living in Canada who was from Lithuania. And the idea behind this was to try and capture the international impact of this huge moment in human history because at least in America, it tends to get painted with this really patriotic lens of something that America did. America beat the Russians to the moon. But then we left this plaque on the moon that says, we came in peace for all mankind. And so I was curious to see how that resonated with the rest of the world. Did they feel like this was an American achievement or was this a human achievement? And spoilers, uh, it tended to everybody, everyone in the book unanimously said that this was a human achievement. And almost all of them said that they felt like it was something that they were a part of, even though they had no connection to the space industry, no connection to NASA, in most cases, no connection to America at all. But it was something that they felt connected to. And it was something that humans did that was great. And it brought everybody together. And so it was a really it was really inspiring and heartwarming to interview all these people and get to hear their memories. It's a little sad to think about, oh, what's going to be the thing that can bring us together like that again? Do humans have enough of an attention span collectively to ever come together like that again? Um, those are the kind of thoughts that I was left with after writing it. But um, yeah, I wrote it with uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, Danny Bednar, who is a human geographer that works with the Canadian Space Agency. Awesome. I actually have that in the mail as slow as uh, snail oh, mail awesome. is these days. <laughs> um, that's a, yeah, the last book I got took a month to get here. So we'll see. Oh, wow. Uh, but with that said, I look forward to reading it because it's not about just the spoiler you gave us on the realization. It's just understanding everybody's perspective, the individual stories. What did, what, what was the take globally? And I think capturing those stories about uh, the fascination with, uh, exploring space back then, even till now, is a, is a good story to tell. What, what do people think now of what we're trying to achieve uh, as, as we achieve it? So I think that brings us to another question. Hopefully, one of well, I say hopefully, I like I like the conversation we're having. Um, <laughs> but where do you see us as? What's what? Where do you see as the next big human achievement for space? I mean, I certainly hope it's humans going to Mars. Like we've been playing in our own backyard for a long time now. And I, I think it's time to go visit the neighbors. Um, there's so much left for us to learn about Mars. And I think as soon as a human sets foot on the surface, they're going to pick up one rock and see something that will completely change our understanding of the entire planet. Like there's a lot we've learned with the rovers, but they're still not a replacement for a human geologist and human experience and ingenuity and being able to just look at a rock and you can tell so much from that. And I certainly hope it happens in my lifetime. I probably won't be one going to Mars, but I, I would love to see some other people do it. So get on that guys. <laughs> you weren't one of the uh, registrants for the Artemis project or the, uh, the astronaut uh, program they put out for uh, a couple months ago. No, I, I'm not healthy enough to be an astronaut. Unfortunately, I might have to figure out a way to like win the lottery and pay my way to space on a private space flight someday. But probably never going to Mars as an astronaut. Well, there's another win for uh, industry and Elon Musk's uh, uh, plan, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I want to thank you for having us on, uh, having, having you on talking about uh, extraterrestrial remote sensing. Uh, I think it's a different perspective for the uh, geospatial community uh, because I, I've always been a fan of space exploration, but to realize the parallels and what we do looking at the earth, looking through imagery sensors from space, from uh, aircraft, uh, from drones, whatever, uh, actually has a very translatable skill looking out, uh, looking the other way, uh, looking at different planets. There's a whole universe uh, that can take advantage of our skill sets. And uh, I think that's a fascinating perspective in that, hey, you know, our skills can be used at not just looking at planets, but, you know, 
everywhere else for that matter. So uh, hearing your perspective on how that translates uh, to Mars has been a uh, has been really enlightening, you know, it's nice, it's nice to see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so it's, it's truly, I think it's a true monocle of what, uh, the, the show is called, right. Uh, what, what the conference is called the geospatial frontier. And I think that's, that's truly what that is too. Yeah, definitely the next frontier. So if, if you're a geologist who likes other planets, your skills are totally applicable beyond earth. Well, that's a wrap, everybody. Thanks for joining us for uh, with Dr. Tony Harrison. I'm Adam Simmons with Project Geospatial with the Geospatial Frontier Technology uh, <laughs> Technology Fair. Uh, join us next time and uh, check the calendar what our next session is. I'd tell you what that was, uh, but we're adding more as we speak, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give a prediction at this point for tomorrow or the next day. So, uh, thank you very much, everyone.